Gary, 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 Gary! Aw, Gary. Welcome to Half Glass Gaming. You know it, you love it. You bought it for your little brother. He's a jerk. He shot his eye out. You know. You, you just keep pushing pause right when he's over the pit. And then he just <laughs> falls in the pit. <laughs> <laughs> I am, of course, the moderator, Julian uh, Lucas Watkins. I'm joined at the hip by the Reverend. Uh, I am the Reverend. That is who I am. At arm's length by Just Josh. Just Josh. And deep within my heart by Mandy. Hi. Look, we're on the track to glory once again. Speak for yourself. I'm tired as shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you had a match last night. I, I did. I I had a pro wrestling match last night, which I got to win, and that was nice. But uh, I was originally going to wrestle a guy uh, who wrestles under the name El Baño, which the bathroom, the, right? The really? the joke is he's this five foot ten. 325 pound white guy who pretends he's a luchador. Hmm. Yeah, I like working him because we're both fat and, I, and so we don't work very hard. <laughs> uh, but he hurt his back and so he had to call off. And so I wrestled a guy named Ryan Cruz who is a great human being and I really like him, but he's one of those small athletic fuckers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I'm going to have to work now. That sucks. And one of the sponsors was like a body shaping fitness club and they were going to sponsor. Our match specifically. So, you know, the two fat guys were sponsored by the Body Shaping Club. And they thought that idea was hilarious. They, they were all for it. Yeah. But it, it didn't pan out. They so, got yeah, Wasserman. Yeah, right. They got Wasserman. Well, so he has this picture of him helping a bloody Hulk Hogan out of the ring. And Wasserman, like, tells this long story about going to Japan and how he and Hogan were buddies. And he was doing that one time uh, in front of Terry Fox, who was the guy who, you know, I went to for actual training uh, and usually work for. And Fox was like, funny, I've never been to Japan. Yeah, that's me in the background of that picture there. And it is. He, Fox is in the picture in the ring that Wasserman was using to say, you know, this this is me and Hogan in Japan. Why would you want to pretend like you're friends with Hulk Hogan? Right? That guy's a dirtbag. I actually yeah. heard that um, that part of the uh, ruling against Gawker was punitive damages. And I agree with that because I want Gawker punished for making me think of Hulk Hogan having sex as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this went weird places. <laughs> But yeah, I had a match last night, and now I'm tired. I worked very hard, mm. and it was fun. Well, it sounds like the perfect recipe for sitting down and enjoying some Stardew Valley. I played a lot of Stardew Valley recently, although a week and a half ago, like after putting 70 or so hours into Stardew Valley, I got it into my head that I wanted to give Fallout New Vegas one last chance, which uh, and this time around, I'm like, you know, I'm going to download some clothing mods, and that way I can play Pretty Princess Dress Me Up and see if, if that helps me play the game a little bit. So that was a week and a half ago, and now, literally 80 hours later into the game... <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, New Vegas was a curious game for me. I, I liked so many of the technical aspects, I guess. Um, The perk system was, I think, a little bit more well-rounded. Being able to sort of like mod, in-game mod weapons. Right. uh, Companions kind of were a little bit more interesting. But uh, overall, the world just felt so uh, dead and empty. In Fall 3, you'd see a house in the distance and you'd go look and there'd be a little mini story going on in there. The maybe. are so good in Fall 3. Oh, yeah. I just love to wander around and find weird, super gimmicky vaults Mm -hmm. like the Garys. The Garys. (laughs) Yeah, I I once uh, came across a note and a key with no indication of where to use it. Hours upon hours later, having to be raiding a random house, a nondescript house, and there was a mini house um, model on the desk in there, and it was locked, and the key worked, and all of a sudden... (laughs) I opened it up and I was like on this whole new branching path of nothingness, but uh, man, that was pretty cool. 
I actually really enjoy just playing the radio and wandering the desert wasteland. Mm -hmm. Like, something about that really appeals to me. Oh, yeah. And, of course, you know, I've put in some mods that add some stuff to it. Like, uh, you know, I have a lot of mod-added radio stations now because mm -hmm. the vanilla radio stations are kind of lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, one I got adds um, sci-fi radio plays it's from, you know, the 40s and 50s. They just take short stories and turn it into radio dramas. It's in vanilla Fallout 4. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And the other thing that, that helped was it finally clicked that Fallout doesn't want you to be a generalist. Like, you have to decide how you're going to play it at the beginning, mm -hmm. and that's how you're playing it. Mm. So, you know, this time around I went, all right, so I'm going to just pump my points into charisma and luck and see what happens. And then I'm accidentally talking the, the main antagonist out of being an asshole. Like, I didn't even mean to. I was just curious what the answers were. And he's like, oh, well, I guess I won't nuke the entire Mojave. I also found a mod that adds a bunch of different perks as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I have no idea what's the original perks. Well, and they added the um, extra perk system in New Vegas that wasn't in 3 and didn't return in 4, where... You can add like up to two extra permanent perks that might give you, you know, um, a bonus for using automatic rifles, but right. your firing speed is increased, but your accuracy is lowered. Right. Um, there's the one that turns the wasteland, they have all these little mysterious, peculiar things that kind of pop up. Right. Um, but one that I really liked was, I think it's called Logan's Run or something, where it just boosts your stats, but once you reach level 30... Um, basically all of them go away and you're just like at level zero then for the rest of the game. Huh. I, I, there's one, again, I don't know if it's original or not, but called Where's My Pants, where you just wake <laughs> up, and you woke up in the desert somewhere with your pockets full of money and your pants missing. <laughs> I don't think that's in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the idea of that. Like, how, how does that work? I keep wanting to take that just to see. So I compare New Vegas to, to Skyrim, because that's the, you know, game I have so much experience with. And I love Skyrim, but all of the quests are, are solved essentially by some flavor of hit it with a sword. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here in, in New Vegas, they're like, well, no, you can, you can talk your way out of things, but then, like, that's, you're playing this. You're gonna mm -hmm. have to figure out which dialogue trees you need to go through oh, yeah. to even find the option where you can talk your way out. This guy's looking for his son. Right. You find him, and then what do you do? Do you join the cannibals and right. eat him? Or? I, just, I just went through that one, actually. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, I just, I find that really interesting that they manage to come up with, no, you still have to play this, mm -hmm. and if what you want to do is talk, well, then clearly you want to read dialogue, so figure it out. Yeah. And that's that's really interesting, and I really like how they did that. And so what I'm getting to is that Obsidian should just make all of Bethesda's games from now on, really. Or at least team up with them. Yeah, right, something. And with the core mechanics, but let Bethesda kind of... Yeah, right, pay for everything. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, I'm really getting into it now, and I'm already trying to figure out what my next, uh, character is gonna be. Uh, probably something like Veronica, because she, she wants to look pretty and punch the shit out of things. It's like Obsidian looked into my very soul and then made my soul a companion. <laughs> voiced by Felicia Day. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Mandy got told today that she looked like Felicia Day. Whoa. Yeah, I could see that. But yeah, that was at Caribou Coffee, and we were there the other day, and I ran into uh, a potential time traveler. Oh, nice. This woman was uh, on, a, on her phone, and she was standing there. She's like, oh, yeah, this is so weird. I have a computer on my ear. And she was, like, just talking about her cell phone. And then then uh, she was like, oh, well, you know, how do I come find you? I need to, to come meet you. And then she, like, put her phone down and was like, Ugh! and, like, pointed at her phone. And it was like, I just... There's some maps on here. This is. Would you look at that? And she was like showing it to me, like, like, oh my gosh, look at this thing. It seemed like she was a time traveler from the past. It's yeah. like, you know, just getting used to this new technology. Wow. I mean, she likes it in the present or the future to her, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, it's a curious thing. You know, sometimes you think, oh man, wouldn't it be nice to go back to a simpler time? And then 
well, you don't know what the future has in it. So yeah, see, you, know, you got a phone on your ear. It's a computer with maps in it. I mean, yeah. See, I I see these memes on Facebook sometimes. You know, remember when we were kids and we went outside to play instead of just sitting in front of the TV? And I'm like, I mean, I played a lot of video games as a kid. So yeah, well, yeah, like I don't, and I'm the oldest one in this group, right? So like that's, that's, that's the not other, even valid, right? That's the other like and the people most making of these, these are probably like 21, yeah, right? <laughs> It's like, dude, when you were five, you had the freaking N64. Like, don't pretend otherwise. <laughs> right. Yeah. When I was five, I had Super Mario Brothers 2 that I played the shit out of. <laughs> when I was five, I was frolicking through rolling fields. I mean, the hills were alive with the sound of music. <laughs> you, you you seem like the type who was frolicking through open fields. Yeah. Julian has been prancing through the fields in Far Cry Primal. Yes, I have. Oh, prancing yeah. and uh, how, lighting shit on fire. How is that? It's the first Far Cry that I look at that I go, that looks like it's interesting beyond just being a good FPS. Mm-hmm. The the animal training mechanics look really neat. So, yeah. so how is that? I think I love it. Overall, uh, a Far Cry hasn't really done it for me since um, Far Cry 2 until I played Primal, which I think is fantastic. 4 was really my favorite one, I think. You know, I think coming off of 3, it kind of just was more of the same, that complaint that's kind of been going around. But I mean, you played you played 3 right before you played 4, though, right? I did. And then I took a break from 4 when I switched consoles. Um, so I didn't pick four back up until months uh, months later, but uh, then I started to get back into it more because I was just kind of powering through it, um, which I think added to the enjoyment. The first time, you know, I spent so much time getting those fucking diamond chests and oh, yeah. all that shit, and then looking for letters, and it's like it just wears on you, and I think it spoils the game, which there doesn't seem to be as much of in Far Cry Primal. Primal is really a, a much more stripped down Far Cry game. I mean, mm-hmm. even the story isn't that long. Yeah. I got the platinum trophy in that game and put maybe 30 hours into it. Mm-hmm. But it's weird because, like, on Far Cry 4, I would put in, like, you know, I would have a good, like, six hour play session and I would look and my completion percentage would have gone up, like, maybe 2%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in Primal, it's like, I'd, I'll play for six hours and look, and it's like, oh, I increased 15%. Mm-hmm. There's a lot less stuff to do. And the the story's not that long. You you basically play through, like, five story chapters. Uh, after that, you have a bunch of people that you find out in the wilderness and mm-hmm. convinced to join your society. Each of those characters has a story that you kind of assist them with yeah and so you can kind of once you get to that point you can kind of do it in any order you really want to yeah yeah i'm struggling to to even realize which are the main quest lines and which are just right you know. and i mean that's that's mostly because it's set up in such a non-linear way mm-hmm. like the story splits into like six or seven directions yeah. and you can advance each of those directions at will kind Mm -hmm. of yeah like i I didn't get um the enemy allies that you kind of take from their settlements um from the udam and uh oh yeah yeah yeah. those guys i didn't get till much later probably than i should have so i didn't have their weapon upgrades or or whatever they they offer you until just recently actually so i mean i waited a really long time to do that stuff too the thing like the the animal taming is so much fun yeah but i tamed i was like maybe five hours into the game before i tamed a saber tooth tiger mm-hmm. and once i had a saber tooth tiger like the game was on easy mode until you know i started getting really deep into it again mm-hmm. it really felt like you weren't supposed to be able to do that stuff until way later uh, yeah it seems like the first couple hours that i was playing it it felt really really difficult and then yeah slowly you kind of just get to a point where you're like okay i'm good although at any moment you could still be killed by like a cave bear but, I mean, once you have the tiger, even the cave bears, like, you know, maybe attack, but then they see your, ca- your saber tooth and they run away. Mm-hmm. And it's like a whole pack of wolves will come and try to attack you. And they just take one look at your saber tooth tiger and they run away. Yeah, Are you just yeah. like, you know, you want to take over like a camp or a bonfire or something? You just send your saber tooth in and let them do all the work for mm-hmm. you and just kind of hang out and, you know, stand on the perimeter to 
maybe throw him a, a hunk of meat if he gets <laughs> taken out or something. Yeah. But it does get harder. The um, I can't remember what the second faction is called. The the Sun yeah, People Zima or whatever. Yeah. Something the Sun Walkers. Or yeah, it was or like that. the Sun People or something, and they uh, yeah, you know, they're the ones who like throw fire and stuff. Yeah. And they have they have dudes who have big clubs yeah, that are, are flaming, worst. and they've got a bunch of armor on, and yeah. they can like. They can take out your saber tooth tiger in a couple hits. Yeah. And so once you get to that point, it's like, yeah, I can see how this is. The difficulty has spiked to mitigate the fact that I have that tiger. Mm -hmm. But like up until that point, you know, I probably spent a good half of the game being just way overpowered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't roll around with um, animals. Is it like your thing with companions in Fallout 4? <laughs> it's, I don't know. I, I like the idea sometimes it's, the, you know, in the middle of the night. You know, you run around and those wolves come running at you. So you light your club on fire and you're fending off <laughs> against them. And you light the grass on fire and make a run for it. And I bring those guys out when I'm going against a big camp or something for sure. My Saber's Youth is loud and unwieldy. I've never successfully done a stealth mission because my Saber Tooth gets in the way all the time. Yeah. And so I figured out that you can kind of send them away by pushing right on the d-pad and then pushing x over their yeah. portrait when you've got them out and then they'll go away yep and even so like once i put my my animal away i don't have the patience to <laughs> do the whole camp because i've been so spoiled by that saber tooth tiger mm -hmm. for the whole game new vegas has the the cyborg dog that i bring with me everywhere and i put in the brain that was hopped up on all those drugs so it's super fast and i'll just be wandering around and suddenly have the slow motion kill cam i'm like where oh well i guess my cyborg dog just killed something i didn't even have registered on my compass yet yeah in far cry you'll get like a sort of notification beast kill in the corner right. of the screen you're like where the fuck is this thing right <laughs> what did it just kill <laughs> But it, you know, it is noticeable. It doesn't bother me, but it is noticeable. The mini map, you know, the same icons represent flowers as they have in the last two Far Cry games. The animals are a little bit more prehistoric in nature, but they're, yeah, it's the honey badger from the game before it and the game before right. that. And well, someone even did a side by side comparison of Far Cry 4's map and Far Cry Primal's map and. Uh, they were matching basically like the water mm -hmm. and they'd be like, oh, this river is here is exactly the same. This lake here is exactly the same. And they kind of circled the features that were exactly the same. And there's they, they definitely use the Far Cry 4 map as yeah. at least as a starting point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I really don't notice that just because of the time within which it takes place you have gigantic trees and interesting flowers that glow at night and uh, glaciers in the background so it's not as noticeable looking at like kirat as it is with um what is it oro oro or Oros, like that. yeah um but i mean there have been games and uh in the past and recently even uh, that have flipped assets um in a much more noticeable and uh, perhaps troubling way, which will bring us to um, today's uh, topic, um, asset reuse in video games. So before we get into that, though, um, as always, I'm going to call break, uh, give a couple of thanks to uh, Wheelie and 2XAA for the music. Of course, uh, you can find us on RetroVolve.com. We will also find a wealth of uh, retro-related articles. You can also find us on halfglassgaming.com where you'll find a detailed list of all of the games that we touch on for each and every episode. We're also on iTunes. We're on the Stitcher. Okay. So with that said, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about video games that reuse assets. <laughs> We are back from a break. We're here to talk about asset reuse in video games. Now, it seems lately this uh, idea has kind of sprung up and accusations have been flung and people stand up and they say, OBJECTION! But is this asset reuse really uh, a new phenomenon or does uh, this uh, begin in a much earlier, simpler time for video games? No, 
know it's funny that you reference Phoenix Wright because Capcom is pro- are probably the masters of asset reuse. Anything that can be reused from any of their games, they will reuse it. Hmm. Uh, Morgan from Darkstalkers, they reused this exact same sprite for her for seven games in a row, even when they <laughs> updated sprites yeah. for new characters. So they got to a point where graphically her sprite didn't even match everything else. They were still reusing it. They're, they're very careful with their money at Capcom. Well, they're very like- careful to take people's money and to <laughs> Not save theirs. Any. But to, so they would make everybody, every other character, like, improve? Except- well, you know, with the major characters, they might add moves for them, and so they'd have to create new animations anyway, so they'd obviously add new characters. But Morgan didn't get any new moves, mm-hmm. and, you know, she was introduced ah. in the original Darkstalkers, so every single game she appeared in, she had the exact same... They did update her eventually. They got to a point where they couldn't, but seven games, you know, all the Castlevania <laughs> games have an insane insane amount of asset reuse anything well, anything yeah. well like every touched. every single mega man enemy that wasn't a, a robot master was a reuse somewhere hmm. i'm sure that uh also is the case for those dirty rotten scoundrels uh nintendo yeah yeah i mean nintendo is certainly reuse assets from they've probably done the best job of asset reuse of yeah. any company ever, but absolutely they weren't afraid to reuse their own assets, and uh, they get a lot of flack for it now for the new Super Mario Brothers games, but it's not like the old Mario games didn't reuse assets either. Mm. Uh, that's what? part of the reason the real Mario 2 didn't release here is because they were worried about it not even really being a new game. But it wasn't really a new... like it No, was... it was an expansion pack. Yeah. Or that, that eventually came out here is what, the Lost World? Lost, Lost levels. levels. Lost Levels, yeah. For people that maybe are in the dark as to what we're talking about, asset reuse, what are we talking about here? We're talking about literally taking something from one game and just dumping it in another one and calling it something different? Well, just any asset that you create for for a game from a building to even a tile set Mm -hmm. to animations, taking that asset and using it in another game. Which can be kind of, I guess, tricky to maybe spot. Um, Sometimes it's glaringly obvious, perhaps, but um, you got to assume something like that, especially earlier in in, uh, video games, went on quite often and without any nefarious intent, perhaps even. I mean, save a little money, save a little time. No, I mean, it was really common in the 90s for companies to just take a game they'd created and reskin it and release it as something else. And we've talked about that in previous episodes of the podcast. There were a lot of brawlers that were reused. Um, A lot of licensed games are changed to match different properties that are popular in different reasons. There was a Game Boy game called Baby T-Rex that was just constantly being released as other different games really? and they'd leave the same story concept and most of the dialogue the same and everything i've played every version of it mm-hmm. and they're almost identical all they do is change the main character sprites and maybe some of the enemies but not all of them um decap attack on the Se- sega genesis was flying turbo adventure magical hat <laughs> <laughs> reskinned okay the original sounds a little bit better but okay yeah. Yeah, I liked the cap attack. I thought it was cute, but it was less cute than Flying Turbo Adventure Magical Hat. Mm-hmm. And that reused assets from uh, the NES game Kid Cool. Oh, wow. Okay. Everybody remembers Kid Cool. Yeah, right. Classic, legendary property. Okay, you got a company pumping out games left and right. You know, Yo Noid, whatever. Um... <laughs> well, Yo Noid reused assets too. I liked Yonoid. It wasn't a great game, but for what it was, it was entertaining. And, you know, so many of those restaurant games wind up being really terrible. And mm-hmm. it was, it was, you know, it was a solid platformer. Capcom had made a game called Masked Ninja Hanamaru, mm-hmm. and uh, they got asked to make a Yonoid game. And so all they did is reskin <laughs> Uh, Mass Ninja Hanamaru because they weren't going to release it in this region anyways. Uh, and they wouldn't have released Yonoid in Japan. Right. So. Classic Capcom money-saving move. Those mm-hmm. are very frugal guys at Capcom. Man, that Noid was frightening. That was like a garbage pail kid. 
or something bizarre. Okay, so you're running into companies, like I say. They're pumping out games left and right. Maybe save a little little time. You use a candlestick from Castlevania in your whatever game. Surely then there also has to be instances where there are companies stealing assets. That's been a problem since the 1970s in mm-hmm. Pong. Uh, the first uh, lawsuit <laughs> regarding stolen video game assets was Magnavax versus Chicago Dynamic Industries in 1977 okay. for Pong. And uh, that continued on. One of the more interesting lawsuits back then was Midway versus a company called Dirk Schneider. Dirk that- Schneider, of course. <laughs> Famed company Dirk Schneider. And what they did is they'd create arcade games that were the same concept, same level design, and they'd put in new sprites. So this was really testing it because the first Pong clones were literally exactly like Pong. And they're yep. like, look, this violates my patent. So they were really open and shut cases. In this one, they changed the assets. They took like the core asset the, like the level design the concept and then you know pac-man is yeah. a different little round guy eating slightly different shaped ghosts and so it was a test to see if it would hold up that they were different and one of the things that they did that really screwed them over was that they actually advertised their games as being ripoffs <laughs> they put up flyers like new game just like galaxia that seems like a poor choice yeah, maybe if their games only cost a dime. But this was in 1981, so yeah. video games were still pretty new territory. So they lost? Midway won, won the lawsuit, mm-hmm. and Dirk Schneider was no longer allowed to make their ripoff games. And then a company named Omni did the exact same thing that Dirk Schneider did, so Midway had to go back to court two years later to defend their games again. Yeah, Midway. Th- those guys are such underdogs. Right? <laughs> they, they had a rough time in the 80s. I'm sure they They did. made a lot of good games and everybody wanted to rip them off. Well, well were... that's the entire uh, system was bootleg games. Yeah. You know, like you get this Game Boy Color game from China and it's actually this other game that's been reskinned for Sonic or something. So that brings me to what has to be my personal favorite. The Super Mario Brothers, as re-envisioned as... The Great Gianna Sisters. The Great Gianna Sisters is great because I always thought there had been a lawsuit yeah. to get it pulled from the shelves, but that's not what happened. Nintendo went to them and threatened them. <laughs> and they pulled With the game from violence? the shelves. No, I mean, they, all they've said is that Nintendo went and spoke to them and they agreed to pull all their products from the shelves. And yeah. the Great Gianna Sister was was really well reviewed mm-hmm. in spite of it not being a blatant Mario clone. Yeah. And, you know, it was selling pretty well. So I think Nintendo sent some of their Yakuza buddies. You're right. Like, <laughs> well, the box art is quite titillating. Yeah. Well, they, they they kept the franchise alive. There was a Deanna Sisters game on the DS and it was great. It was mm-hmm. not a clone. Mm-hmm. It was just a really fun, cute little platformer game with the Deanna Sisters name. Yeah. When it, you have a company like Nintendo that has all of those Yakuza <laughs> roots <laughs> right. that we've talked about before and you just hear a story about, oh yeah, they went and talked to this other company. Yeah, right. No. Talked. It just <laughs> kind of implies mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. They like, grab your ankles and right. dangle you out of the win- dangle you out of the window. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, and I mean they confirmed that both parties are on record as saying, "Oh no, we just sent people from Nintendo to talk to them." Yeah, feels like a Suge Knight Vanilla Ice scenario all over again. You're right. Yikes. I actually got that reference. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I know that reference. I feel clever. <laughs> One of the games that Josh is sort of fascinated by is the game that stole assets for Sonic before the first Sonic was released. Mm, oh. oh, I've seen that on a YouTube review show. The Adventures of Quick and Silva. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. It's a ridiculous name. It sounds like it's referencing something. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Before the first Sonic game came out. They must have found, like, promotional art or something. There was a Sonic comic book released before the game mm. was released. But they have, like, the actual, like, sprite. Yeah, that's true. It's it's pretty dead on. They have the Sonic mm. sprite in the game, but I think Sonic is actually, like, a bad guy. He or, like, an, he's enemy. an enemy. One, One of the, the enemies. Games. Cool. On, the, on the cover of the, the game box, mm-hmm. there's actually a picture of a hedgehog, but it's not, like, a Sonic hedgehog. It's, like... An actual hedgehog. <laughs> Crazy. I've never heard of that. It's a, it's about um, a princess who wants to take over the kingdom, and then she hires robots that can solve any problem with or without cheat codes. It's for the Amiga. So was there a lawsuit then? or No. I mean, I don't think anybody noticed, because who was playing the Amiga? <laughs> True. 
Who was playing Sonic at that point? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> well, it was Sonic that. wasn't out yet. That's yeah, what I mean. Right. So it's like. <laughs> I mean, and there is no internet. I mean, well, there is internet, but the internet wasn't what it was. Yeah. And so people couldn't even catch that. Nobody mm-hmm. even noticed until about 2011. Oh, yeah. Well, there's no subreddit. There's a quick and silver subreddit. <laughs> so what is this Limbo of the Lost? Uh, this sounds like an interesting one. Limbo here. of the Lost is uh, amazing because they managed to steal assets from pretty much everything in existence. It was a, a PC point-and-click adventure game released in 2007. And not only did they steal uh, assets from a bunch of games like Oblivion, World of Warcraft, and Sea Dogs, they stole assets from a bunch of movies right down to dialogue. They mm-hmm. stole dialogue from Spawn. Oh, wow. They stole assets from the movie Beetlejuice. Like, they <laughs> colored over their arts, uh, the, the, the stills from the movie for, like, backgrounds. They stole dialogue from parts of the Caribbean movies. So they just stole everything. They copied level design from the, the first Thief. It's an adventure game. You don't even really need level design because you're just walking around and clicking on things. Mm-hmm. But they eventually had to stop releasing the game. The problem was that the publisher had contracted another company to do a lot of work on this game. And apparently that company was pretty lazy about it. Man, that's that's a lot of... Uh... Theft, I'd say, which kind of brings us to a question. Is asset reuse a problem? Is it less of a uh, problem if, if, it's, if it works or you don't even notice it? Or is it always a problem? Do you think it's a bad idea to rest on your laurels in that respect? I mean, in theory, asset reuse is really just smart programming. Because, I mean, your programming is better if you can reuse stuff and get uses out of pieces of code mm-hmm. uh, numerous times. Especially now with how costly game development is. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it can be an issue, certainly. But even to go to Cap com like all the phoenix right and ace attorney games heavily reused assets until ace attorney 5 and that wasn't a problem at all because nobody cared that these characters were using a lot of the same animations from game to game yep. the, the story was all new the cases were all new there were new sites to investigate there were mm-hmm. new gameplay mechanics so as long as you're doing it well it's fine and of course it's poorly done but i don't think the problem is that they're reusing assets yeah, yeah pretty much i mean like you know you're an artist julian you're you're a stand- you do stand-up comedy you do sketch comedy you mm-hmm. make music mm-hmm. you know i'm a writer josh is a writer and a musician like i think we all know when something works you want to use it as often as possible it it only becomes a problem when you're trying to shove it into something that it's like no this doesn't fit here mm-hmm. it's just it's way too out of context and then that's when it's a problem or when it's just outright stolen from someone else. But, like, that's not even the reuse that's the problem. That's mm-hmm. the theft that's the problem. I guess, have you come across any clever examples, let's say, of uh, asset reuse? Majora's Mask okay. is pretty much the gold standard for how to reuse assets well. Josh's faith. Mm-hmm. It's not. I, I own, like... Six Majora's Mask shirts, but uh, it's his favorite game to own shirts about. Sure, <laughs> yeah, it's probably my favorite game to own shirts for. But I prefer Twilight Princess and Wind Waker over Majora's mm-hmm. Mask. I would say Majora's Mask is probably my third favorite Zelda game. No, in Majora's Mask, I mean, I, I assume you're, the assets they they reused was from uh, Ocarina of Time. Yeah, they deliberately reused assets and sort of tried to make the game feel like a dark mirror of Ocarina mm-hmm. and a bunch of different ways and at the beginning the very beginning of ocarina of time one of the very first things you see is link riding opponent in a big open field yep. and one of the very first things you see in majora's mask is link riding you know a sad downtrodden opponent in like a dark uh-huh. forest so it's sort of deliberately supposed to make you think about ocarina and it's supposed to make a lot of moments have more impact or make things more creepy and unsettling and they were also able to release that game only a year after mm-hmm. ocarina mm-hmm. and so the heavy asset reuse allowed for a short development time and sure. for them to spend a lot of time on a really interesting time travel mechanic and a really interesting story mm-hmm. well and i guess I, I, uh, the same could be said for Link to the Past and that uh, 3DS one that had come out. 
in like between worlds. Yeah, I mean, isn't there a lot of similarities there as well? But it's, it's certainly designed to echo it. It's just not the same. It's not, you know, reusing assets mm-hmm. so much as maybe level design a little. Mm-hmm. And it's deliberately designed to echo another Zelda game. Mm-hmm. So I guess at least for that, you know, if it's deliberate and an aesthetic choice. Yeah, I mean, you can't really blame them for that. They were using these assets to sort of invoke feelings that you had already experienced recently. Plus, the more you can use stuff that's already made, uh, the more time you have to focus on the new and interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And, like, I don't think every video game needs to be all new. Mm -hmm. Like, too much innovation is just as bad as not enough. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the thing. Like, when it's done well, it's done because the developers know what people are looking for when they buy this kind of game. And, like, okay, well, we already have assets for that. We'll just use that Mm -hmm. and focus on the one little bit that's going to be new. Mm -hmm. Like Majora's Mask and the time travel mechanic. Sure. Or Super Mario Galaxy 2, uh, when it was in development, it was called Super Mario Galaxy More. And it was basically going to be, like, a remix um, with a lot of, you know, reused elements and stuff. They kept having ideas in development, though. And they kept, you know, pushing the envelope a little further and a little further and being like, oh, we have this new idea. Let's try this. Let's try this. And it eventually evolved into something completely different. But, you know, there are traces of the first game that still exist inside Super Mario Galaxy 2. Mm -hmm. I think at one point they're even calling it Super Mario Galaxy 1.5. What about Persona 2? Persona 2 is really interesting because uh, when they were originally developing Persona 2, as they got to a certain point, they realized there were all these interesting things they couldn't explore and like that they felt the story was hampered because it exclusively focused on high school students and they're like well let's reuse all these assets and make a second persona Mm 2 that focuses on a lot of the other stuff we can spend more time in the joker curse we can like make this about a reporter and a police detective and so they did that and then the first persona 2 persona 2 innocent sin had a bunch of hitler stuff in it and they're like (laughs) oh we're not releasing that outside japan (laughs) and so only the second persona 2 came out here it was released as just persona 2 eternal punishment Mm -hmm. It's the first Persona game I ever played. So by the time the other Persona 2 got released here, years later, it looked like it had stolen all this stuff from a game that it was actually released a full year later. Huh. But uh, no, it's a great game. I mean, it's a perfectly fine starting place for Persona because you don't you don't have to have heard the other half of the story. So but I mean, the best way to play them now is on PSP. You Mm -hmm. can get them both there. So there's no real reason to skip it. Either Majora's Mask or Ocarina of time uh there's a spot where if you either have a game shark code or you know what things to do you can summon up uh, an r-wing from Star Fox and fight it mm. and the reason that's there is because they were using the movement of the r-wing uh to get an idea for this boss that was in the game that's like come some kind of air snake boss and they wanted the movements very similar mm-hmm. Yeah, that was Ocarina of Time. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that, right there, that's an example of, like, a benefit. Right. Using something that you have to influence a completely different character or a right. part of a game that normally doesn't deal with that sort of a mechanic. Right. I can only assume it also helps keep budgets low, especially yeah. if you're an independent studio. Yeah, like, well, the Disgaea games didn't update their assets at all, aside from introducing new ones until Disgaea 4. Mm-hmm. And because at that point, not having HD assets was really noticeable. And I mean, that's great because while well, Disgaea 1 sold really well, most of the other Disgaea games haven't sold mm-hmm. that well, but it's a pretty profitable series for them because they're able to keep the budget super low. Uh, Etrian Odyssey, even Pokemon. Pokemon initially heavily reused assets, uh, like Gold and Silver Mm -hmm. reuse a lot of assets. In subsequent Pokemon games, they tend to create all new animations for the sprites, but in the early days. Well, and and there, you know, it'll help the developer focus more on story, which is primarily, I think, what those games are better known for. Pokemon? (laughs) I mean, with this guy, let's say, as opposed to cutting-edge, bleeding 
yeah. graphics and uh, long I mean, I say, yeah, inch gameplay. television screen off the wall, you know. Yeah, this guy is more about gameplay and I strategy. I mean, every series mm-hmm. has a lot of gameplay refinements, and so they won't create many new sprites. And mm-hmm. You'll see a lot of the same moves and animations, but there'll be new and interesting gameplay mechanics, mm-hmm. lots of cool procedurally generated content, and they'll improve their ability to generate that stuff, experiment mm-hmm. with a lot of new ideas. I think if you're worried about whether or not a knife in Call of Duty whatever is the exact same knife in Call of Duty whatever, it's completely unrealistic and, and is of no no uh, of no importance that this knife needs to look different. It's the fucking knife. Right. You know, if you're sweating over a fucking knife or, you know, some guy's trousers. Um, <laughs> or, you know, whether or not one, the game on one console has more grass than the other. <laughs> right. And look, uh, the new Deus Ex is probably going to be almost a spitting image of the last Deus Ex, which is fine with me because it's a fucking great game. And I know this new one's going to probably be even better. I'm going to play it. In uh, Metal Gear Solid 4, they painstakingly recreated Mm -hmm. a huge portion of Metal Gear Solid 1 in the new game engine. But when you first get there, Snake has like a memory sequence where he remembers getting to Shadow Moses Island the first time. And you play it in like PlayStation 1 graphics (laughs) and everything. (laughs) Nice. That's awesome. (laughs) Like you replay that first sequence. It's so good. Yeah. For me, I think one series that has always stuck out um, for asset reuse as far as even uh, actual assets of the game, models of uh, items and such, but then also with mechanics, is that goddamn Assassin's Creed, man. Yeah, Ubisoft has never been afraid to reuse assets. You know, and they would never fix the found the basic foundation they just kept adding more weight and more weight onto it until it eventually just buckled I, I think there was even a quote at some point a few years ago where they had said you know they were talking about the um, house that they had developed um, I think in two that allows you to um, upgrade it as you go and sort of make this little city and how like understanding how to do that will allow them to then reuse assets for you know the next however many installments down the road it's like that doesn't <laughs> It doesn't bode well for, you know, guys like me who are worried that this is never getting any better. It's just the same thing, but more bloated. Well, even the first Assassin's Creed, it was a lot of reusing the same assets within the same game. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, you know, you would have those towers and they were all exactly the same. Yeah. And, like... well, and that's something that open world games, you know, you look at Grand Theft Auto, let's say, well-crafted game. Even if they do reuse some assets between installments, they're based on an era. So car models more accurately reflect that era. Um, so it has the same car, but it looks different. But when you're actually in any of those games and you pay close enough attention, you see the same woman walking down the street six times in a row because there's five of her on the street and this one's looping back around. You know, it's like... <laughs> it's like a Tom and Jerry chase. Yeah, you'll go down to the docks and eight of the same guys are just standing there. Or, or then there's the... Various Bethesda open world games where they've got God. five voice actors for all the NPCs yeah. and they all repeat the same 11 lines. Yeah, yeah it's like that one African-American dude. Yeah, right, the, <laughs> you know? the one. Hey man, what's going on here? It's ridiculous. Did you see those warriors from Hammerfell? They have curved swords. <laughs> I um, always try to make sure I have a scimitar so I can impress the guards with my curved sword. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I had the um, Meru's razor, and every so often a guy would comment that I'm like, where did you get that blade? You know? Right. Best keep your hands to yourself. Because I was a thief killed guy. Sneak thief. <laughs> well, that kind of brings us to retitled games. That, I would say, is a big problem. Mm-hmm. And that was especially a problem in the 90s where they'd take a lot of sports games that were already update games, you know, the annual releases, and then yeah. retitle them. There was um, an instance in the 90s where IGN refused to uh, review a game called Olympic Hockey 98 because it was just Wayne Gretzky. Gretzky Hockey 98 with the new box. Really? And so they said, well, we'll give you a new review when you make a new game. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, snap. I, yeah, I, like, we've already reviewed this game. In the same year. Right. <laughs> and I mean, but that was that was really a problem in the 90s. They take a, a lot of those games, especially sports games, and they just slap a new title and cover on them. And, you know, if you were mm-hmm. a kid who was really into hockey or soccer or tennis games, you might pick one of those up and waste your $70. Yeah, and those games were not cheap back then. Yeah, especially if you like something like hockey. I mean, how many goddamn games get released in one year? One, and now this other one, but it's the same one. <laughs> I mean, and, and I think that 
is part of why people have been complaining about asset reuse because like they're not really complaining about asset reuse mm-hmm. as in so many things what they're complaining about is how often certain publishers and developers have done those exact things mm-hmm. you know just released the same game with a different title or these days you know on steam they just take a bunch of assets and throw them into a game willy-nilly and go there's the game like mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't develop anything mm-hmm. you just you just stole a bunch of assets I see people complaining about. Yeah, well, like, I'm, I'm sure that oh, there are. Oh, you saw that NPC from that one game? Was right. I'm, I'm sure like, that there are. Oh, some my people. money back. Oh, I'm like, sure that there are some people who who are complaining about asset reuse altogether. Mm-hmm. But those people are dumbasses, and we can ignore them. <laughs> yeah, it's like playing Firewatch, and you come across one of the books written by the father character from Gone Home. <laughs> um, I demanded a refund. Right. Look at this shit. <laughs> Sloppy. It's lazy. Uh, but no, I think um, when the game delivers, it doesn't bother you as much. Right. Well, I, I mean, even like sports games, those are basically the same game every year. Sure. Just with a tweak to a certain feature. They very rarely. I mean, wrestling games. Yeah. No, I've got I've got seven years of wrestling <laughs> games that you know. Oh well, it's the, it's the same game with some new match styles mm-hmm. or. I mean, it's bad enough that everything is already just a remake of Castlevania. Right, exactly. Um, now we're running into these issues. But no, so I guess we should talk about Dragon Age 2. Yeah, Dragon Age 2 was really frustrating because, I mean, they created new assets for it, but they created so few assets and it was the most boring game because mm-hmm. it's go explore the same places over and over and over again. And those games are already really repetitive. Yeah. They'd have whole areas that were reused assets from other areas in the game. And I think, you know, NPC reuse bothers me a lot less than area reuse. Yeah, especially true. in a game, an open world game, which is designed for exploration. No, that's the probably the worst example I've seen of that mm-hmm. in a big budget game. Mm-hmm. But they didn't they didn't do it for the third Dragon Age game. To be fair, there are a lot of very diverse areas to explore in that game. Mm-hmm. I play all these games and I hate Dragon Age. I don't know why. <laughs> Man, he's got a bone to pick with Bioware. I don't. I don't like Bioware. <laughs> I keep playing their games. It's the worst. I, I'm the worst. I, I don't know why I do this to myself. Like, one of the first games I bought for PS4 was the Dragon Age Inquisition. And Josh is like, how are you liking it? I'm like, oh, it's a Bioware game. But, I mean, I still bought it. I willingly bought it. Yeah. I'm the problem. For the reason <laughs> asset reuse exists. It's all my fault. Well, that's the first Sorry, step guys. is admitting that you have have a problem i guess that brings us back to far cry because i think it's a good example of a game that yeah i've seen a lot of these assets in the previous two games but for whatever they did even slightly differently i don't seem to mind it i don't mind it either and they really cranked that game out fast Mm -hmm. i think we're all surprised at how fast it came out and so i think even before any of us had played it, when they were still announcing and talking about it, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people suspected that there would be a lot of asset reuse. Yeah. The weird thing was, I think a lot of people were expecting a discounted game. Blood Dragon. Right. Which yeah. is, you know, what I was expecting. I was expecting... 40 you know, bucks. Yeah, I was expecting a $40 price tag, which, you know, Julian and I both got it when it was on sale on Amazon. For 35 bucks. So... It, <laughs> We got it for $35, and I feel like it's definitely worth that. Absolutely. As a $60 game, I mean, I still got 30 hour, about 30 hours, and I might go back and, you know, clean up the last of the uh, collectibles and stuff yeah. um, and probably get five more hours out of it. But it's really hard to justify it as a $60 game mm-hmm. when you compare it against Far Cry 4. But I think only if you've experienced those games. If you're new to the series, 60 bucks, sure. Sure. It looks great. It plays great. It should have been like a discount for Far Cry 4 owners. (laughs) It should have just been a digital release only, you know, 45 buck title. You know, there are different ways to handle this. Just taking something from an old game and reusing it to save time or money can be a benefit to a developer. Uh, It can also make something feel stale, like um, Telltale Games or Assassin's Creed. It can be done to sort of juxtapose what has come before it to sort of invoke new feelings and perhaps a new way to think about what you've already experienced and how this is commenting on that. And then there are times when, you know, man, you play Mass Effect 2 and you go back to the Ishimura and it you just... You mean uh, Dead Space? I'm sorry, Mass Effect 2. Fuck Mass Effect 2. <laughs> you play Dead Space 2 and you go back to the Ishimura from Dead Space 1 
And I mean, like, all those horrible feelings come flooding back. And it's scarier than shit. Right. I think. Especially when nothing happens until something fucking happens, you know? No, that was still one of my favorite, like, horror scenes yeah. in a game. It's just so good. It's absolutely brilliant, you know? And then there are instances with Grand Theft Auto V designing Los Santos around the Los Santos from the San Andreas game to sort of make you feel as if you've been there before. It's just somewhat different or new. Brilliant. So, look. It's been around. It's almost a dirty little secret that we don't talk about. You know, it's like that blue dress that you just got stuffed away in your desk drawer at work that you hope your wife doesn't find. <laughs> maybe you've never noticed it. Maybe you have. Maybe you have, but you don't realize that you have. And maybe now you're going to hark on that and, and play games and you're going to just be like, I can't play games anymore. These guys ruined it for us. And for that, I apologize. But uh, this is gaming, bro. Um, so I just want to thank you for joining us on another episode of Half Glass Gaming. And we'll be back next week. Same bat channel. Um, same rat time. Um, and, and you didn't notice, but like 20 minutes of this episode was actually 20 minutes from a previous episode. We just mm-hmm. reused it. Added a few new lines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We took six minutes from a Benny Hill episode. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> so with that, Half Glass Gaming out. Pretty soon, we're just going to basically have this new system where we auto-dial. We have a phone bank set up, and we'll just call you, and you can listen to the podcast that way. Um, And you can press pound if you like it, right? (laughs)